Right. Well, I think we'll get started. It's uh, right at 6.30, and I know people often uh, trickle in, but I wanted to say good evening and welcome to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. My name's Carrie Morgan, and I'm the gallery director here, and I also wear the hat of the program director for the McKnight Visual Artist Fellowships. And um, we're very proud here at MCAD that we've been the administrative home for this particular fellowship program since it was started in 1981. And over the years, this particular program has shifted. It's a program that services mid-career artists who work particularly in the visual arts. And it's shifted in terms of the number of recipients, the size of the financial award, and also the types of professional development development opportunities. But the real reason for its being, its raison d'etre, if you want to say in French, um, it, that's never wavered. And I want to thank again and again, and this is the fourth time now that I've thanked the McKnight Foundation for making these fellowships possible. Um, I and really believe that they will never waver from their belief that the work that artists do, the creative labor, um, is meaningful each and every day. So this evening is the fourth and then final installment of what I think has been a very successful McKnight discussion series. We started the month off with Cesar Garcia, who spoke with Christina Estelle and Selma Fernandez Richter, followed by Claire Gilman, uh, who facilitated a conversation with Kelly O'Brien and Scott Nedrillo. And last week, Michael Rooks was here to chat with Tracy Crum and Alexandros Lindsay. And last but not least, uh, tonight we have arts writer, curator, and educator Michael Nedholte here from Los Angeles to moderate the discussion this evening with Gregory Euclid and Louise Fitch. So Michael is currently the co-director of the program in art at the California Institute of Arts, otherwise known as CalArts. He's organized numerous exhibitions in New Zealand, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. Um, among those, the one that might be most familiar to people was um, the 2014 edition of Made in LA, which was at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, Michael has written numerous multiple monographic essays on artists and has contributed to periodicals including After All, Art Forum, Art Journal, The Brooklyn Rail, East of Borneo, Pinup, and Tri-X, or Extra, excuse me. Um, most recently, he is the recipient of a 2016 Creative Capital and Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. This is a grant program that awards between fifteen dollars and $50,000 to arts writers and is designed to support writing about contemporary art as well as to create a broader audience for arts writing. So this fall, we hope that Michael will be able to work on his book project, which is titled Too Small to Fail, Art and Micro Institutions in Los Angeles. So our two fellows from 2015 this evening are Gregory and Luis. Uh, Gregory is an artist, a high school educator, and a music label owner living in the Minnesota River Valley. His work celebrates and critiques our use and appreciation of land in our culture. Gregory's mixed media work has been featured in a wide range of exhibitions, including The Nature of Nature at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Badlands, New Horizons and Landscapes at Mass MoCA, Otherworldly at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, Small Worlds at the Toledo Museum of Art in Ohio, and also a solo exhibition, Nature Out There, at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, Gregory's work was also featured on the 2012 Grammy Award-winning album covers of the musical group Bon Iver and on the cover of McSweeney's Quarterly Concern Number no. 43. <laughs> Gregory is a three-time recipient of a Minnesota State Arts Board Initiative Grant, and in 2011, he was a Jerome Foundation Fellowship recipient. Um, Gregory also received his MFA from MCAD. Louise Fitch is an artist, designer, mentor, and a creative entrepreneur who is the founder of Uno Branding. It's a strategic cross-cultural visual communication agency not very far from MCAD, just at Franklin and uh, Stevens Avenue. Um, Luis was raised in Tijuana, Mexico, and moved to the United States in 1985. There, he attended the prestigious Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California, and graduated with a BFA in 1990. While he's enjoyed some success, lots of success, with his commercial art through his agency, UNO, his artwork has also been presented nationally and internationally, and is in more than 100 collections in Latin America and the United States. With the accelerated growth of the Hispanic population in the United States, Luis is very anxious to ensure that this community is served. Um, I'll also indicate that recently you might have been able to see some Luis's work here in the Twin Cities, for he was included in an exhibition titled Latino Art Migration, which was a group show last fall at Concordia University. He was also in the show Folklore Remix at Gamut Gallery last summer. And this uh, fall in October, he had been commissioned to do an installation for the Day of the Dead at the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington, D.C. 
So both Luis and Gregory have been very busy. Um, so this evening, after Michael will come up and give a short presentation, and then it'll be followed by a discussion here and our nice, lovely um, yellow chairs. And after that, we'll open it up for questions from the audience the last 15 minutes. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope that you will continue to be interested in what our McKnight artists do. Um, we hopefully will be doing a similar discussion series next year in maybe a different format. But um, again, thank you for supporting our Minnesota artists. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so uh, I think most of you probably know a little bit about how uh, the McKnight Fellowship works. And, and one of the great things about it is that uh, critics and curators like me get to come to Minneapolis uh, once and in some cases twice. And so I was here uh, just under a year ago and got to meet with most of the of the McKnight Fellows, and um, and I'm I'm back tonight to talk with two of them. But um, one of the things that I do um, as a as a critic, as a curator, and as an educator is to spend a lot of time in artist studios and meet with artists, listen, um, and uh, in many cases work with artists. Uh, to help articulate what it is they're doing uh, and, and what's interesting about what they're doing for a wider audience. Um, at least that's how I see my role as a, as a uh, critic and curator. Um, so uh, I, I really like the space of the artist studio. It's uh, whether it's my students at CalArts or uh, artists working in the world, and I've had the, uh, and it's a privilege to spend time in the space where art is being made, and it's a really special environment. It's very different than seeing work in a gallery or um, in a museum. Uh, it's very different than, certainly different than seeing things in a book or uh, on the internet. Uh, and you get the remarkable experience of spending time with the artist and, and hearing about the work and, and seeing the context in which it's being made. And so I think one of the things that I'm I was really interested in in my meetings with uh, Gregory and Luis was uh, the context in which the work was being made and the things that were being made that were not necessarily art, but were happening uh, in proximity to the art that both of them as artists were making. Um, so the idea for tonight is to think about uh, the idea of wearing multiple hats. And I think most, most of us, that work in the art world um, wear multiple hats, whether it's as uh, an educator and an artist or um, some other variation. Often, um, I mean, we're, in the, we're, we're all living in the gig economy, so um, most of us are probably Uber drivers um, on top of everything else we're doing. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's, I think part of, Part of what I'm interested in is, is really th thinking about the reality of, of the economies of artists and how they actually exist in the world and what it takes to exist as an artist and perpetuate a career as an artist, which is really, really difficult. Um, but also the, the kind of uh, things that, that emerge out of that um, and the challenges of that and, and the way that um, different kinds of professional activities can coexist and, and feed into one another. So I think that's really the, the foundation of um, the conversation tonight. I just wanted to talk about a few examples before uh, Gregory and Luis present their work um, to put things in context. Uh, so I start with Marcel Duchamp, um, who uh, actually wore many hats from at different times. And, um, this is one guy's as the, as the traveling salesman where he was actually going to different science conventions and showing these optical devices that he was creating. Um, in this case, uh, a series of roto reliefs, as he called them. And they, they were actually played on uh, record turntables. 
um, and would create these kind of uh, psychedelic effects. Um, but Duchamp had many other, many other guises as well. Um, and for uh, a while, he apparently retired from making art. We later found out that he was actually toiling away in his studio secretly on his last work, which was called Etant Donné. But, um, but most people, uh, and he was in New York at the time, most people knew him as a chess player, and Duchamp was actually a really um, masterful chess player, wrote a book on chess. Um, so it wasn't a hobby. It was, it was, you know, it was a, a pursuit as uh, legitimate and presumably fulfilling as whatever he was doing as an artist. Um, Duchamp referred to himself as a respirateur, uh, a breather. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's his, typical of his humor, but I think it's also, there's a kind of truth to it. It's, um, we do what we do um, when we're awake and uh, conscious. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there's not necessarily a hierarchy among those activities for him, even if the art world might prioritize certain activities over others. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we do things that are maybe more economically lucrative, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, um, there isn't really a hierarchy in which we might think about these things. Um, so I thought that was a useful place to start. Um, so Ed Ruscha, as some people might know, uh, was the design director for Art Forum when it was headquartered in Los Angeles, but he used the name Eddie Russia. Um, and this is a cover he did for the magazine in 1966, uh, which is very clearly a, a, an Ed Ruscha. Um, he was also doing some provocative advertising for his own work in the magazine at the time. Uh, then there's Ron Nagel, uh, who um, makes ceramics, and they're all um, relatively modestly scaled objects. And um, he was in the Venice Biennale, uh, I think in 2013, um, and has a very established career as an artist, showing in galleries, museums. Um, but he actually comes from um, uh, a musical career and uh, was in a couple different bands and put out his own record in 1971. He did the cover for that as well, called Bad Rice. Um, he also wrote songs that were uh, recorded by Barbara Streisand and, um, oh, I can't remember who else, but uh, uh, Leo Kotke, a number of different people um, in the 70s. He, he had a prolific career as a songwriter. And he did special effects for movies, including The Exorcist, which won an Academy Award, um, Cat People, um, and, uh, and he worked on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, too, as well, in sound. So um, I think of him as an interesting example of a multiple hat wearer. Um, and I'm writing something on him right now, too, so he was present in my mind. Um, and then uh, Lee J. Clark, probably as different of an artist as you can imagine from Ron Nagel. Uh, an artist um, who was based in Brazil most of her career and associated with the neo-concrete movement, uh, who started creating these performative objects as a way of breaking away from modernism and painting, and uh, eventually grew into these kind of um, strange works that that had a relationship to therapy. And then at a certain point, she dropped out of art making in favor of a, 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 a therapeutic practice. Um, she was not trained as a therapist, uh, but had a therapeutic practice in, in Brazil. And um, now the art world is able to assimilate the work that she was doing in relationship to different kinds of art making, like in social practice, for example. Um, there are terminologies that we have now that didn't exist in, um, in the 70s when Ligia Clark was making this work, and, and she wasn't particularly interested in claiming it as art. So sometimes the art world will uh, 
or art historians or curators will assimilate uh, something that artists do as art just by virtue of its proximity to the other things that they have done in the world. Um, uh, Keith Herring, um, Luis and I were uh, talking about uh, the importance of, of Keith Herring as a formative artist for him and thinking about the way his work existed in um, uh, in different in different economic uh, uh, forms of circulation, it was it was on the street. Um, there was the pop shop, which Keith Haring started in New York in the '80s, um, and uh, the work was very available to different people at different uh, levels of economic uh, strata, um, and uh, and a lot of the work. Uh, was very commercial in terms of in terms of um, its interaction, uh, which is something we'll talk about. Uh, this is Andrea Bowers, an artist based in Los Angeles. Some of you might know her work, um, and she is um, an artist, but also uh, an activist, and and, uh, and her work often is operating at the intersection of art and activism. Um, and, uh, and it takes really different forms. Um, sometimes posters, sometimes photography, often um, very fastidious uh, photorealistic drawing. Um, so it takes many different forms. And um, it's a poster that she made uh, for the Dream Act in 2012. And then this is a book that um, was included in an exhibition that she did. It was in Los Angeles, but I think she did different iterations elsewhere as well um, that had uh, different flyers that were mostly just printed on a Xerox machine on AstroBrite paper and um, very sort of available technologies in terms of how flyers, protest flyers, and other kinds of flyers circulate. Um, and this book is a part of it that's kind of a kind of a process book artist book um, that that represents the larger installation um, so these were all things that I was thinking about um, and I think I think on the surface of it um, uh, Luis and Gregory's work would appear to be very different um, and I think I think they are really different but I, I think there are also a lot of things that that bring their working methodologies together. And um, so that's something I want to explore this evening. Um, so in the last two days, I've been back um, uh, spending time with them uh, in the places where they work. Last time I, last year when I was here, uh, Luis and I met at his house and, and in his basement where he makes work. Um, today we met at UNO. Um, and so it was great to see both, actually, and, and think about how they, they relate and what kinds of work were being made in, in the two kinds of places and how much those things overlap, inevitably, um, in uh, the relationship of, of art making and, and life. Um, and this is Gregory's studio, which is also his house. Um, and it's out of the city, um, and uh, and you can see his uh, some of his record collection. I felt like I was a like a private detect like a bad private detective or something, taking pictures of these studios. Um, uh, but it's sometimes I like to do this actually when I do studio visits, just because it's a way of having a certain kind of memory of, of the context in which the work was being made, but I'm, I'm really interested in process. And I think there are things that, that reveal themselves that um, we could talk about that were actually really surprising in certain ways in terms of uh, the relationship between using technology and using the hands and using different kinds of techniques. And in the upper right, there's a picture of Gregory's laser cutter, but also stencils and, and um, so I'm, I'm really interested in the way these things coexist in the, in the work of both of these artists, and hopefully that's something we can talk about. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Gregory, 
and uh, and I'll reconnect with you in a little bit. Okay, let's adjust. We're about the same height. Since this guy. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the McKnight Foundation for uh, the support. It's been incredibly helpful for my career um, as an artist, but just as a creative person. Um, the freedom it's given me for the last two years, it couldn't have happened at a better time. I had a baby and uh, tend to, to kind of think I was going to drop off the face of the earth, and it made me not so worried about production because I had the income from that that allowed me to focus on some other things. So that was a wonderful gift. Um, also, I uh, feel incredibly honored to be a, a part of the, the group of artists that I was uh, selected to be a fellow with, uh, or a, I guess it's is it considered a fellowship? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, I'd like to say thank you to the other artists. Incredibly honored. And uh, also, thank you to Michael for uh, the studio visits and uh, this discussion. Um, I think in terms of starting to talk about my work, I'll give you a little brief history of what I do and why I do it, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the connection to the multiple hat theory that we're kind of exploring here today. Um, I initially started making work that was very, very much rooted in um, kind of an understanding of uh, micro, macro, familiar type of layers. And so thinking about a, a portrait being presented to the viewer, but then also including what was happening inside their body, inside of their mental state, as well as what was happening uh, biologically or uh, physics-wise around them. So these layers of um, kind of uh, understanding and how they are related to each other. And that quickly moved into a exploration of land or exploration of uh, place and history, uh, current like you know, ecology, things that are happening in the land, um, and kind of thinking about the layers that exist within a place, how we understand a place, how we experience a place, how our memory and our understanding of, for instance, uh, nature, the word nature, uh, how that plays into how we experience something. And so I started working a lot in landscape and thinking about some of those same things, the layers of um, the you know, the, the physics of what's happening around me, the biology of what's happening, and then also my experience of that and the filter in which I'm using to experience that um, in a cultural context of how we're kind of taught to understand the land. Um, that kind of led me to thinking about moving away from the flat surface. So one thing that I've been interested in in the work is this um, kind of relief idea. And I think that came about strongly when I started to think about modes of representation as a, a metaphor for that understanding of the land and understanding of the, the way in which we experience land. So if I was to paint something realistic that depicted a space uh, that we're supposed to project our mind into uh, with paint, you know, uh, creating that illusionistic space. Um, taking that as a window to the world and playing with that by putting something in front of that window to the world, kind of calling it into question. So I was doing these traditional landscapes where they were very much uh, concentrated on the vista, just a generic traditional landscape that was supposed to drive you into a space. And then I would place something from the actual land in front of that. And I liked what happened at that moment where you have to ask yourself, um, the, the object that exists out in front of the depiction of land kind of debunks the illusion. 
and that kind of uh, thing that happened right there was really appealing to me where the, the, the modes of representation called each other into question but also informed each other. So that was powerful for me because when I was uh, in grad school reading some uh, different books that kind of you know helped me understand how we view the world and how we understand land and landscape and nature, um, it changed the way I could enjoy nature. So I've always been someone who liked to go for walks in the woods and you know just be in natural spaces. But the moment I started learning about how, uh, in essence, I was taught to appreciate that, uh, my understanding of land became uh, almost like a hindrance to my enjoyment of it anymore. So the reason I liked vistas or the reason I liked solitary spaces or the reason I liked to explore was kind of called into question. So there was this kind of uh, interesting thing that happened in my own life and I wanted to depict that in the work. So by making the work uh, relief, you could explore it. It was uh, an element of parallax involved, you know, uh, where you, you move around and it, it changes. So frequently what I would do is build these structures uh, of materials from the land in my, you know, immediate area. And if I found garbage or things like that, I would shove them up underneath the, the work. Uh, and then collectors would sometimes purchase them and say like, oh, we noticed all these plastic bags behind the artwork, like what's that all about? And I was like, oh, well that's what I found on my walk that day, so I picked it up and you know, instead of throwing it away, it's now in your artwork. Uh, it's kind of like a way of stashing, away, recycling, you know, uh, but not recycling, uh, preserving mausoleum style. Um, so much of the work started to be about that kind of tension between my understanding of nature, my really uh, at the root kind of romantic notion of like how I interact with nature uh, and that kind of, um, I guess, uh, that intersection between the, the knowledge of how you experience something and the joy of how you experience something and how those can sometimes be in conflict. Uh, so, I started doing a, 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 a series of works that were erased using Sumi ink, so I would do um, a drawing and then photograph it and erase it. And there was something in that work, and this is one of those, um, there was something in that work that was appealing to me about the impermanence of um, experience, the impermanence of memory and how memory changes and how we can kind of, uh, you know, anticipate that everything will change or be deteriorating. Um, so I started making these works that uh, were to be erased but were really quite elaborate. So spent, you know, hours and hours making them only to just erase them and recording the eraser, uh, you know, the erasing of the, the work. Um, as, I guess, kind of a, a metaphor for a, a bunch of things, but um, primarily it was about work. It was about effort. It was about, like, putting a lot of work into something and then being able to destroy it. Um, so that was appealing to me. And in this particular work here, you can see that there's uh, painting on the background and a lot of um, relief things that come out of the work. Um, this idea of work led me into uh, the, the idea of multiple and reproduction. And so I, I find that I, as a way to uh, show appreciation for something or as a way to pay homage to something, uh, doing hard work uh, in that vein is uh, like a way to show respect for something. And um, when I did the works on the whiteboard, um, students would often ask, you know, like, uh, how can you erase that? Why are you getting rid of that? You should, you know, do something with it. Uh, and I, you know, I had said to them that if I, if I left the work 
as a piece of work, I could sell it in the art market for this much. You know, it would be worth this much. Um, but if I erased it and created a narrative around it that it was a work that was and now it's erased, if I took a photograph of that work and sold it as a reproduction, um, I bet I could, you know, this was a proposition I made to my students, I bet I could make more money selling the reproductions of this work than the actual real work itself. Um, and part of the, the idea was that them being, you know, 14, 15 year olds uh, in my classroom who listen to MP3s and, um, you know, don't buy albums, they lose their iPod, whatever, they just go torrent down all the rest of the music that they wanted again. There's this kind of impermanence in their culture where uh, I grew up with CDs and you didn't want to leave them in the car because they would melt, you know, or records where you were afraid of like dropping the needle in the groove every time you did that. So there was this, in me, there was this element of permanence. Well, I saw that in them. Uh, and again, this goes to the multiple hats. Being a teacher has shown me a lot about how the, how other people think. Um, so teaching 14 and 15 year olds and asking them about like how do you interact with nature, how do you interact with the land and do you respect this or do you care about this and so on. Uh, it, it often comes down to music and that's like my gauge, that's my barometer. So how they listen to music, how they treat music, how they respect music is kind of a gauge for me to understand like how do you interact with the world around you. So this idea of me erasing a piece of artwork they were like destroyed by that and i thought that that was really interesting like that they would actually care about an original you know we think of a uh, uh, walter benjamin like the the aura of the original and how, the the importance of this thing um and, and they actually cared and i was like wow that's interesting because i would think like in a throwaway kind of society you wouldn't care about something you would just say like well we'll get another but they were interested in the fact that I worked on this that it took effort and then I was the one destroying it so I did take photographs of the work and I did sell the prints and we made more money from the prints than the original would have sold for and they were impressed by this of course, because there's two questions that someone will ask you in high school when you show them something of your own. Uh, how much would that sell for? That's the first thing they ask. And then how long did it take? So money and time are two of the most important things to them. Um, so uh, this idea of a multiple uh, and this idea of like MP3 society where you can just download something and the, phys the physicality of something no longer matters. It's just streaming now is like, you know, this is the new thing for uh, kids. You talk about downloading MP3s and they're like, what's that? Uh, no one downloads anything anymore. It's all just streaming or even watching it on YouTube or listening to it on YouTube. Um, so um, this got me thinking about what could I do as a music lover to create something that's meaningful. So if you look at these works, they're incredibly baroque. They're like super time consuming. They're very ornate. Uh, there's almost like a, an, a, an obsessive quality on detail and uh, little, you know, like every one of those trees is picked from the yard, dried, take moss from the yard, dry the moss, crush the moss up, spray the tree with PVA glue, drip the moss on top of the tree, let it sit upside down, spray it again, so it you know, stays together. It's incredibly labor uh, intensive. And um, I wanted to take that and carry that over into something uh, like the music that I'm interested in and show the students that, um, the, you know, like this idea of work or this idea of making something valuable uh, that's an original um, was maybe something that was uh, interesting to them or trying to make them interested in that idea that an original still matters. So this is uh, the album cover from uh, a very famous uh, album, Bon Iver, Bon Iver. And this was a, a major turning point for me, not in terms of like the type of work that I made or the uh, the project itself, it was a very enjoyable project, 
to do because I got to work with a musician. Uh, you know, I would be texting Justin, the lead singer of the, the band, the, basically the guy who makes up the band, uh, back and forth showing him pictures of what I was working on. So there was this kind of symbiosis about how this image came about, and that was kind of interesting to me. But more so than that, what was great about this project was that the prints from this album, the sale of that image right there, allowed me to do things that I could never have done before. First of all, I could stop focusing on selling artwork because uh, at, a, at a cost of $200 per print, these were flying off the, the shelf. And so now through reproductions, I could afford to do something that was um, maybe a little bit more in line with what I was wanting to do, which Ultimately, we get to this, where I started a, a record label with that money, and the McKnight funds helped me buy a laser cutter um, so I could cut my own uh, sleeves and design my own things. Um, so loving music, I, I wanted to make a project that was a way of paying homage to these musicians. But I also wanted it to be something unique in that uh, I wanted to have a hand in it still. I didn't want to just like receive submissions from someone and then release them on, you know, on a record. So I started up with the idea called Thesis where I would curate musicians and ask them to work together. So I would be listening to something and say, this would be great with this. And then I would contact those musicians and ask them if they would like to work together and part of the model for thesis is that I pay them up front. Well, this was kind of unheard of for the musicians because normally they have to wait forever to receive their funds from the, the work that they've done. So I wanted it to be extremely uh, musician friendly. And so I, I paid them up front to do it. And part of the, the catch was that I would make uh, every album jacket and sleeve by hand and that there would be a unique cover on every work. So 300 unique covers, 300 unique sleeves, and they're all cut with laser. So each one of these, this is a one album, so it's like a flipped over. Um, that part that's on the top right there is actually this part that's on the bottom left. Um, each one takes a little over two hours to make. And um, part of the, the project is the, the labor element that I wanted to try to put the most amount of time I could into each particular thing as a, almost like an antidote to streaming, uh, to make it a precious object again. And also be involved in something where I'm creating or generating uh, culture in, in essence, uh, where the artwork is part of it, it's part of the enjoyment of it, but also it's me as a, uh, a curator uh, for musicians. So I've really enjoyed this project and recently started doing a, another project along the same lines which is called Print Track where I ask uh, a musician to respond to a piece of artwork to create uh, music and vice versa where they create music and then I create uh, a graphic from that. So uh, at this point this is brand new. I've only uh, I've got three people lined up to work on, on this, um, three different, uh, so six musicians. Um, but initially, it was just me because I'm cheap, you know, like I, I can do it for, you know, for free, uh, just takes time. Um, but my goal is to end up having a network of visual artists who are working in conjunction with musicians, creating, uh, you know, kind of a symbiosis between the, the visuals and the music and to be able to kind of network uh, all the artists who are paired up in this particular thesis as well as the print track. They really haven't heard of each other's music before. But me being an avid music listener and all different types of music uh, have a tendency to pick things that seem like there's some nexus between the, the two artists. but they haven't heard of each other before, but when they get together, they're like, oh yeah, this makes totally sense. You know, this makes total sense. Um, so my goal is to have a bunch of visual artists and a bunch of uh, musicians kind of working together back and forth and just being able to curate that in the future. 
and that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, and I, I, I still get to do the art part of it, but it's also involving a lot of the things that I, you know, have loved all my life and have been uh, appreciating all my life, uh, the musical side of it. So in the print track graphics, I'm still doing paintings, uh, taking photographs of them and bringing them back into the, the prints uh, using like a Photoshop and Illustrator uh, to generate these things. So it's a, it's a way in which I can kind of uh, still be involved in a certain element, but also kind of relinquish a little bit of control in terms of, uh, I'll be doing these initial ones, but then kind of passing it along to the other artists in the future. So I think I'll leave it there because we can kind of talk about uh, more of that stuff when, when we have our discussion. So thanks, Louis. Good afternoon. Let me start by uh, giving some thank yous to the McKnight Foundation for this fellowship. I am truly honored to receive this. Uh, it's, uh, it is even greater honor to be placed with, uh, in such distinguished ranks and those of the past and present fellows, most of whom have been uh, an inspiration over time. Uh, all of them who have made significant contributions to art in our city and state, and all of whom I uh, consider being a great source of inspiration. When I uh, give special thanks to the judge committee for having the generosity of uh, no nominating me to Carrie and the, the rest of her staff for administrating this and uh, answering all my questions. Uh, to all the art critics who visit us from all over the country. Um, and finally to Michael for being here today. So, quick thanks. Um, for the last 20 years when I moved here to uh, the Twin Cities, the reason I came here was for graphic communications and design. And since I was 13, 14, I've always done illustration, art, and graphic design, and mixing in one way or another. Uh, and I noticed that a lot of my friends were getting the fellowship, and uh, it was re I was always interviewing them after that. It's like, how do you get it? What's the formula? You know, and each of them will have different stories and different ways of, of doing it. And they've always said, you you should give it a try too. And uh, but. 15 years ago, uh, instead of focusing on my art, my wife and I decided to create a person. And so it was totally different. So I have to focus on design and give out the art and focus on, on this little person. And so all my creative energy uh, went to that. But one day I decided to pick up the phone and, and talk to Carrie and say, Carrie, you know, a lot of people always said, you should try this. And but I'm a, like a graphic designer. Can I do posters and she said yeah last year somebody very similar tried this right and so I, I tried it and I said uh, I'm not going to look at it from the perspective of fine art I'm going to see it from the perspective of branding design marketing and if there's fine art there I'll, I'll, I'll try my best so one of the first things I wanted to do is it's um, once I, I, I got the fellowship said I'm going to recycle all this work that I've been doing digitally and, and make sure that I can use that uh, because of my limited time that I have between the business and fine arts. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to see it if I can brand myself in less than a year uh, in the art and see if, uh, if, I've, if I can develop products or art that can target different demographics. And, and, not, and not only demographics, but different consumers who buy art at different levels. And so one of the first things I wanted to do is just create this uh, toolbox of, you know, digital art, a graphic style guide, <laughs> uh, 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 my own branding through photography, um, have control of media, uh, do guerrilla advertising, and we're lacking some images here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and then product development. 
And so um, I wanted to make sure that I was able to do art that it was, some people call it low, all the way up to, to high. And what I mean by, by low is that I can go to my community, to the Hispanic or Mexican community here in town or any other parts of the United States and really give art for free. And so that meant that I had to do reproductions that was very inexpensive, uh, do quick public art, uh, create a 24 hours website where I can have affordable art of reproductions, right? Limited edition, Jumbo site, still screens. Uh, I wanted to make sure that this art was able to be licensing to. And so I wanted to make sure that this extension of, uh, of the art, it wasn't just not one piece that you take to the gallery and somebody will buy it and it disappears. I wanted to own the rights to continue to resell that. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that I was able to do as quick as possible when I got invitations from art galleries, pieces that cost anywhere from 200 to 1,000. Uh, that's the average of the people who buy my work. But at the same time, other art galleries were established who want better pieces, and so it required a different technique or a little bit more work into it. And then what I call museum quality art, whatever that is, right? So I would like to go through that uh, and explain how I did it in this last two years. And so the, f the first thing I wanted to make sure is that I have enough of this multi-use digital art that I can always go back to it, and there's no excuse that I don't have time. So uh, I can, you know, if I only have 20 minutes or 50 minutes, I can create anywhere from a small, you know, canvas piece uh, or small print boxes that I can give away in a limited edition and they're all signed uh, in the back to my community and then use social media to tell them where it is and people can pick up the art uh, all the way to mixed media on canvas or stencils where I can use it to reverse graffiti or use for murals or product development. And so for me, that was really, really important because I didn't want it, again, the way that I used to do art in the past where I had a lot more time and I didn't have a kid. So now it was a little bit different. So once I created this graphic eye style, a style guide uh, for myself and I didn't have to think about colors or image or anything, all I needed to do was really uh, be ready to promote the brand or myself. Uh, and so here's a picture for articles uh, that, um, that Rick Sfera, uh did of me. And for me, that was part of when a newspaper called me and they wanted information. Instead of me giving my face, I created this brand of me and I wanted right away to be out, you know? Uh, I invested on, on that same image uh, for $450 and create 500 uh, posters that I've been putting all over the city and in different cities to create again this image, right? And it's, it's all, the way that I was looking at it is from a, a marketing perspective. And then for $100, I got 300 stickers and I just literally went around the world and start putting them up in places that are tolerable uh, for this kind of work. The other thing that I wanted to take control was of the media and what I mean by that is I grabbed some money from the fellowship and I invested on the city pages. I put some ads. First time I've done this uh, because I want it to be my own gallery. I don't want galleries to be paying for this. Plus galleries don't pay for ads and uh, at least the ones that I've been involved with. And uh, I learned that, uh, that really it was a huge investment and so it was positioned in the wrong, the wrong uh, uh, magazines and yes a lot of people saw it but not the right target so <clears throat> once I saw the return on investments I decided to focus more on social media and this is where I noticed that there was uh, a lot of better opportunities for me and people start reacting in uh, more to the work and wanted to buy it and that's where I needed to create a website that uh, one that I can manage and own in 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 see it more as my own gallery that it was open 24 hours. Another thing that I learned that when you put art that matched the color of the sofa, <laughs> people can visualize it better in your space. But I was being sarcastic about, you know, the, the, the way that I wanted to uh, show this, but I was trying to really be consistent with the colors based on the two bucks. 
Uh, then I focus on pricing. I mean, I was literally being the, doing the Walmart thing, $49.99 kind of deal, right? Uh, and so I, I saw uh, a lot of people responded to it in a positive way. They didn't see it as, uh, oh, this guy's a commercial person or he's a sold out. Uh, they, people don't have uh, a lot of time to shop for art, at least my demographics that I was targeting. And so to have all this information consi consistent and having an image per day before a show or before uh, uh, a sale that, that might happen in my website, it was uh, very positive. And, I, and it's a lot of work, but I saw that, that, that it was uh, a different way that I've never done uh, before. Um, so the other thing too, I wanted to control the advertisement. Does, uh, and so instead of me uh, wanted for a gallery in Tijuana or Barcelona to call me, I went to the city and brought the gallery. And so uh, I'd start, any city that I went, start doing my own thing. And, uh, but not one piece or two, I mean, each city there was a lot of them. Here in Minneapolis, I noticed that in East Lake Street, where there's a lot of Hispanic or Latino community, there is, for some reason, a bunch of phones that don't work anymore. And so I start using them as uh, nichos, you know, this, uh, and painting them and, and putting art uh, for them. So uh, any city that I went, um, instead of going and interviewing at the galleries, I just went to the actual places where they allow or they're tolerable uh, to put work. Some places they're not, like in Miami. Um, the other thing that it was really important for me, in, 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 uh, even before uh, I got the money, was <clears throat> to be able to put art in the community. And it's nothing new. People have been doing murals in communities, uh, but I've never seen anybody giving their art to the community, literally. And so I wanted to do uh, in a way that it was easy for me to reproduce. These all recyclable boxes from FedEx that comes to our offices or pizza boxes and then I paint them in one day so you can do like a hundred of them literally and then with recycle house paint I paint them all over then print them glue them and so in, in two days you will have like a hundred of these pieces number them sign them and then every week I will put something out in their neighborhood and let people know through social media and if you're interested you can just uh, follow me at free art uh, hashtag free art um, then the other investment that I wanted to do was these affordable jumbo size limited edition cell screen prints. These are a, a few of those. And uh, I, I wanted to see, you know, there's this uh, trend in the last 10 years about Day of the Dead. And I wanted to see how, how could I bring that uh, into a house uh, uh, or to an office that, that becomes part of the decoration and look at it more from a decoration perspective than uh, uh, a celebration for one day, that being November 1st or 2nd uh, for Day of the Dead. Another investment, like I mentioned before, was my virtual gallery. And uh, this is um, something that we spent a lot of time in strategically making it happen. Uh, and then once it was uh, uh, done, it really, it's, it's a self-contained thing. So you can start getting all these uh, sales uh, through uh, the internet, but working together with social media. And, um, and it's interesting how um, it first started here in Minnesota and then California and then Texas and now places like in Spain or, or London where once one person buys it, I don't know if two weeks later they see it and the other one wants it. But anyway, um, there's this uh, uh, interesting geographic areas where there's more interest in this kind of work than others, I guess. And, 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 it's, and once you have this information, you can even buy advertising geographically if you're interested. So there's a lot that you can learn from uh, who's buying it if you document it right, correctly. One of the first shows that I had uh, last year was at Gamut uh, Art Gallery. You know, it was called Floor Clore Remix. It was three artists, uh, two Mexicans and one uh, local. And I wanted to do pieces uh, that were affordable. And these are large size pieces. Uh, we'd paste on, on canvas with mixed media and 
sand on them. Another group show was at the National Museum of Mexican Art here in, Chica in Chicago, uh, celebrating their uh, anniversary for Day of the Dead. And uh, the curator came and toured Minneapolis and saw my poster, so he was really interested in who I was. And, uh, and then he asked and, and gave me a call and asked me if I wanted to uh, participate in this. He said that he had a wall at the end of the exhibit and he wanted to finish with me. If, and I said, well, if you allow me to do a weed paste, uh, I'll be really, really interested. And once he mentioned that that door, it's the exit door, uh, literally uh, exits to the gift shop, <laughs> uh, I was it. You know, I had to do something that talks about how Day of the Dead is, uh, in, in the United States has been so commercialized. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to do this piece called Sold Out. And the interesting thing is that once you go through this door, there will be t-shirts and postcards <laughs> based on, on, on the, not only from, from mine, but other people. And so um, it was more of a question uh, because it's, it's becoming more than a trend. It's a, all the hipsters are like not only wearing it, but using it as par part of their tattoos and whatnot. So for me, it was interesting, uh, that particular piece. I got uh, another opportun opportunity uh, with the Mexican Culture Institute in, in DC. This was uh, an invitation to stay at their um, uh, gallery museum, uh, or, or at the Institute, for five days, and uh, to create a piece that uh, went along with this room. And um, I wanted to commemorate all those mothers in Mexico who have lost their uh, kids because of the violence in, in, in Mexico in particular. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, when I was talking about museum quality work, uh, not only the McKnight gave us money f because of the fellowship, but still they gave us another $3,000 to invest on materials and anything. And I decided to to buy uh, museum quality frames and, and, uh, and make uh, these pieces that uh, are bigger than, than, than I, that I usually do. And, and they're made out of uh, blood. Uh, and again, it's just talking about the violence that it's, that it's happened in Latin America. And, um, and just to have something that it was a, a lot more quality uh, if any, uh, art collector wanted to buy versus all these other pieces that were at different price points. And with that, I'll finish. Make sure it's to me. I don't know who's going to need it first. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I actually, that occurred to me in, in meeting with both of you and talking to both of you and, and then seeing your presentations is that the way in which those of us who wear multiple hats inevitably end up uh, collaborating. There's a social aspect to what we do um, that I think pulls us out of the kind of, um, I call it the heroic mythology of the individual artist, um, which is often how we perceive the studio. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how that works differently for both of you and, and certainly something that Gregory and I talked about a lot was how, how the work you make, it's very labor intensive, but there's a, um, you, you're in control of it and you know you know what you're going to get or what you can get. But when you contact two musicians out of the blue and ask them if they're willing to work together and with you, there's a kind of element of surprise to that too. And I think that's, I think it's one of the, um, the aspects of, of um, 
collaboration is that you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. So, um, and I think I think in in your case, you you work with corporations. You work with you give away art to people on social media. Um, so, I, was there a moment where you became a collaborator, or was that something that was interesting to you early on? How do you think? How do you think about it? Well, I, I, well when I was younger, uh, you know, I was doing art. I preferred to, to be by myself and nobody watching me. When I had the studio, uh, you have to collaborate. And so it's a group of us. And that's why the company is called Uno Branding and not Louise Fitch Design. Mm -hmm. It's a group and everybody has, you know, the same credit. Uh, and, and I have no problem collaborating with other people even nowadays with fine art. So if somebody asked me for a large mural, I doubt it I will have the time, like I mentioned before. Mm -hmm to create it, but it might be designed by me, and I might create the stencil and art directed, and there will be a group of us installing it or making it happen. Uh, and, you know, they can even give me better ideas that I might have, because I'm not an expert on murals, and I will receive them well. So this whole idea of uh, collaborating with other creatives, uh, the older I get, the better it's, it's uh, that I've received it. So I have really no problem than when I was younger that mm -hmm. I did, you know. It was like, it's, it's about me, and then this, and see, you know, uh, I didn't want it to collaborate with anyone because it was more of a, I don't know, if an ego trip that you have to do it by yourself, and and uh, and plus the, the work was, you know, it, 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 there was no reason to collaborate with other people, I mm -hmm. guess. Now we will get together as artists and philosophically talk about things, but then each of them will go to back to their studio and create, but never mm -hmm. had the opportunity so I don't know if I answer the question yeah. or not. Yeah. Was there a conscious decision for you Gregory in terms of that was that part of it in terms of thinking about starting the record label and thinking about the really specific set of procedures and the kind of invitational aspect of of what you were doing? Yeah I mean I can't play music so <laughs> <laughs> I'm horrible. Um, but uh, being a visual artist and your own practice, it's so much about yourself and it's so much about like your lexicon. There's, like, there's a predictable outcome, it seems. Even if you like have a breakthrough in terms of something, it it's still seems like it's within your trajectory. And when you throw these two atoms at each other, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get. And that's, at this stage in my life, that's really appealing to play more uh, with other people, and we talked about this, but like when you when you bring one musician with another musician, they have their entire history and where they're drawing from, which you're not always a hundred percent privy to. Like you don't quite, you may know where they're at with their recordings, but you don't know where that's coming from necessarily or what's hidden behind that. So when you bring these two people together, frequently what you thought was going to happen. Uh, the outcome is w way greater than what you could have anticipated and that excitement for me is more interesting than um, uh, you know, what I'm doing in the studio. So to me at this stage it's, it's more interesting to play with uh, bringing elements together and seeing what can happen, especially people who don't know each other. So I feel like I'm making this social connection between them. A lot of these people will go on and work together again they've already said you know we plan on doing this uh, you know again or they just become aware of something that they weren't aware of previously and so that that's like uh, probably the most interesting thing for me is the the realm of what's possible whereas when I sit down and I look at a white sheet of paper or even contemplate like making an installation uh, I have ideas of things I haven't done before but it just seems like uh, way more interesting to me to, and the frequency at which it can happen too. The thesis has been around for one year, roughly, and I've already got 14 projects going, and it's anything from, you know, 
the guy who, uh, Michael Price, who wrote the music for Sherlock to Dustin O'Halloran, who did the music for the movie Lion. Uh, these people have this incredible talent, and for me to be able to just say you and you and have it happen, that's kind of exhilarating. So. One of the things that occurred to me that seems really obvious, but, but you've both made work that um, has been seen by extraordinarily large audiences that might not ne necessarily recognize you as the artist, or um, uh, this is obviously with packaging design or, or you know, um, kind of the larger commercial projects for sure, but even, even the ubiquity of the Day of the Dead images appearing in Barcelona and, um, you know, the, the way those things emerge. And then with Bon Iver, for example, it's, you know, even the people that are listening to it on iTunes or YouTube are still seeing your work in, in some kind of terrible way, but they're it's still the seeing it. It's the best resume I've ever yeah. had, honestly. <laughs> like uh, going to Berlin, I can be sitting in a coffee shop and someone will say, well, what kind of work do you do? And you can just say that. And it's kind of like they didn't know, oh, that's you. You know, that's the response always. But you're both really invested in, in tactility and have such an intense appreciation for the handmade object and the way one encounters that object and even just talking to Luis about about your silk screens and, and what happens with those prints once they get hit with water or wheat paste and the kind of textural elements and the way they exist over time um, and uh, you know seeing how your 10 inch records are made and the kind of enormous amount of labor and the kind of incredible kit of parts that you know leads to 300 unique versions of a multiple um those those things are really specific and i think i think there there's an audience that that for those items that that encounters them up close and it's very much about this kind of tactile encounter in the world mm -hmm. and possibly even one that can be traced back to you through um Instagram um, and being able to like get an object in the world but know where it came from and have a kind of line of communication or even the distribution of records which is for a very specific community and it's not necessarily the Bon Iver community right that is going to be interested in those those records and the way that they circulate and it's a very different culture than the it's related to the gallery culture and the distribution of art, but it's a different audience and a different kind of subculture that is interested in these things. I'm not doing a very good job of asking questions. I'm just talking. No, you're doing well. Okay. Let me see if I can continue. <laughs> so, yes, I guess you're right. Uh, to me, it's not important that, that when they see, the people see my artwork, and more in, in the world of the internet, that they go, oh, that's a Louis Feach piece. I, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Uh, but in the world of the internet, there is a group of people mm. who are interested in finding out who is that person. And the last two years, I noticed that from social media friends that I had under my Instagram with Luis Fitch, by putting articles and things that had no relationship between one and the other, uh, and being inconsistent, uh, my friendship was very, you know, uh, it, it was not growing. And so I, after the fellowship, and, and I started being consistent with this brand, branding, if you want to call it, uh, it went from 1,200 to close to uh, 5,000 or 6,000. And, and that's a lot. Uh, and so when you take a picture of, of a sticker in London, you think that a lot of people are not going to look at it. But as, at the moment that you put hashtag and you put London, hashtag sticker and and then the actual address there's this world of people that start looking at it and and if they like stickers and if they like your art they start following you and once they following you you got something for them uh that they like or you're in their city and you're having an exhibit they will go and so uh, i noticed that that being consistent and being brand in this two years uh, with the color and the images and, and, and everything that, that I've done, uh, there is a new group of people 
that really uh, are aware that I exist, or the work exists, I should say. And they want to find out more about you. Yeah. No, no. I <laughs> <laughs> One other thing that I was thinking about is um, the way you've both embraced the ephemeral and um, giving art away, for example, or you know, wheat pasting things and letting it letting it go. Um, but also the 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 whiteboards and the, the notion of erasure and um, I mean, I'm, I I was touched by the story about your student responding to your willingness to destroy something that you created and um, before the talk tonight we were having coffee and talking about uh, the classroom <laughs> and the high school classroom in particular and thinking about different sort of generational cultural values and and how the handmade um, and the intimate um, and the you know, the kind of art object that lasts might have a seemingly different relationship to a different generation, but um, I, th I think it was telling that, you know, your student would be surprised and I don't know if they were surprised because of their own values or projecting your values about, about what it means to erase something that you've created and the kind of labor involved in it. I, I think for for, the 15 year old or 16 year old who sees something the actual like the idea that you put effort into something is like uh, enough almost <laughs> you know like the idea that you would work on something is like half the battle or like half the intrigue um, that you would actually make something on the wall and then the fact that you would erase it, they're like, whoa, you took effort and then you took the effort away? Like that's, you know. So there, for that generation or the, the, those students, it's, a, it's definitely a, it's a weird thing. The moment you think you have them like pegged, you, you know, you, you, you find something out that they're surprised about. I was shocked that they would be surprised about the erasing, I guess. I didn't, and then that kind of, was the impetus for the whole project, uh, this idea of a reproduction, you know, because I always just assumed that, like, they were totally cool with reproductions and, you know, seeing stuff on the internet as opposed to looking at the original, but then I found out that the original still had value for them. Um, and, you know, like, for, for the records, that's, it's a, a media that requires severe amounts of attention and it degrades over time and it's like a, you have to be cautious about it and it's a physical object it's it's kind of like uh, you know the opposite of which I, direction I, I think things are going and but, uh, yeah so that 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 classroom notion of them being interested in the, the physicality of things uh, we see it as adults I think in things like Etsy or like Amazon homemade you know these these branding things where like it becomes important to have something that's unique uh, like that but um, for their generation I, I was kind of shocked by that I guess so now they're all reading Walter Benjamin yeah right <laughs> uh, no they're not buying records either uh, they still stream stuff. You said you know. people were irritated that your records don't come with the download code. Extremely irritated, yeah. But then there's also the group of people, like you said, it's a subculture. So there's the group of people who will buy it because it is there is no download. They like that and they want it to stay true to that format, that it there won't be a download. So I, I didn't mention this, but the records there's no digital version of them, it's just the record. So people, people really want to have a digital version, but the reason I made the whole project was because I noticed myself as a consumer and was kind of disgusted by my own behavior. I would go online and download you know, tons of music and then like I'd have so much music in there that I, I, I would have to reckon with the fact that over the course of three months I had purchased 50 albums and I really had only listened to some of them once if that and just kind of became uh, uh, like annoyed with the fact that I expected art art 
to conform to my lifestyle. Like I wanted to listen to it in the car. I wanted to listen to it on the airplane. Instead of taking time to bend my lifestyle to fit it. So I thought of like, well, what's the most like obnoxiously pretentious way of listening to music? Well, like, you know, on a 10 inch record, which is like a unique weird format that doesn't fit in with all of your other uh, you know, 12 inches and you have to, you know, you got this record that's like super, um, like the packaging is difficult. So you wouldn't even put it on the shelf with the other records cause it would crush it. So I, I made this thing unique as a, as a way to kind of combat my own desires, which was to, to consume music in a way that I felt was disrespectful to the artist. Like I, I wasn't even paying attention to what the song titles were or any of that stuff. So by by starting this project, I basically uh, acknowledged that um, the way that I was doing things in my own life was kind of uh, counter to what I actually believe. And it was just, I kind of was mindlessly doing it. And so the, the generation of something that is precious was a, a complete backlash from, from that way of living my life. Yeah. Should we take questions? Does anybody have a question? Any questions from the audience? For, our, for Michael or our fellows? Uh, this is for Luis. Uh, I had a question regarding the imagery, actually, within your work. Um, it seems like I was wondering if this was it was intentional or not to. Um, I mean, so you have kind of the Day of the Dead thing going on. Um, so in a way, I feel like it's um, you've taken the imagery and kind of guided it to use it for positive things, as well as as well as making art itself. Um, was that an intentional? Was that an in, you know intended um, direction? Is to use it kind of as a tool, or or just did that kind of come about organically from that? From it the, was definitely organic. Um, I've been doing projects for Day of the Dead for the last 25 years, and, uh, and they always said, you know the, sim the main symbolism is the skull, uh, but when I start adding uh, the bodies and and all this other ornamental. Uh, work that is inspired by Papel Picado. Uh, it, 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 little by little, it, I start creating a language, I guess, that really, once you have these personalities, uh, like one of them is the president, and everybody knows that that guy is the president. The guy with the hat, he represents the president of Mexico. Uh, he's well-dressed, uh, and so on. Uh, it, it becomes my language that it was easy to, uh, uh, because of lack of time, to go to that toolbox and create that language that I was trying to. So it, it started uh, organically and it was a happy accident. By the time I got the fellowship, it was it. I, did, I was not gonna take time to explore a new language or anything. I was gonna do exactly what I've been doing for so many years and just go crazy with it because of the lack of time that I have. Hi, this is more of a comment, I suppose, and it's actually, it uh, turns out directly related to what you were just saying, uh, Luis. Um, I just was thinking about how both of you used the year that you had the McKnight to both diversify your practice and streamline it in different ways, and it seems like that's in relation to um, pressures on the time you have uh, as artists, the time we all have. I'm thinking of it in relationship to this wearing many hats thing too, and I'm just curious how going forward you see yourselves either streamlining or diversifying your practice in relationship to these time pressures. You wanna answer sure. first? Um, I had a, a child uh, two and a half years ago, and then I just recently had a child six months ago. So. Uh, you know, as an artist, you hear constantly people talking about, oh, well, there goes your practice, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and if you want to be a good parent, yeah, that's kind of true, 
you know, like I, I would have a hard time saying that I could keep up the same level of participation within my my practice and be a good father, you know. So I had to think of something and like like I said, the McKnight came at the perfect time for me because it gave me space. I could say no more gallery shows. It gave me space to kind of pull back and say, well, what do I really want to do? I've only got so many hours in the day. I get home after I, I teach uh, high school and I get home at the end of the day and it's like makes up or, you know, all the routines of stuff. And then you get like an hour and you're, that's at the end of the day, which is probably not the best time to be like, hey, you know, <laughs> fresh, go to the studio. Um, in grad school, I worked until, you know, three o'clock in the morning and taught all day. But, uh, you know, that's just not practical now. So I just took and what I could possibly do. And for me, it was like, I can be a manager. Like, I can do all of this stuff over the internet at seven in the morning. I can do this stuff at like three in the morning when I wake up and I have to change a diaper for the baby. I check my phone and I'm like, oh, so-and-so contacted me about the masters. Boom, you know, send an email off. So the idea of uh, becoming a, a different type of creator more of a, a manager as opposed to a producer. I still have to make each one of those, you know, like album covers for two hours, but I, I can do that in a, a block and I'm like a machine at that point uh, where really it's all about efficiency and it's all about like, you know, the, like creating a, a, a kit, like Luis had said, you know, like um, doing kind of modular production of things. Um, but for me, it was uh, really about thinking about my role and what I can offer in the time that I'm given. Uh, and certainly, the time off for the McKnight really helped with that. But I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I was able to think of this. You know, was able to come up with this idea of being a a, a producer in just a different capacity because it feels really rewarding for me, even though I, my name doesn't necessarily go on the work, um, it's almost more rewarding for me to see what other people can do together than it is for me to see like what I could try to muster up at this point, you know. Yeah, I, I think they call those people creativepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's, you're creative and entrepreneurship and it mix them together. Uh, in my case, it was, you know, very similar. I mean, it's the lack of time between my professional design studio and, and in this free time that I have, plus the kid that, that I was mentioning where he's already 14, Boy Scout, swimming, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Uh, and so whatever available time that I had, I, I needed to react fast and, and, and productive. But going back to the money, uh, when, I, when I first got it, uh, I already had it all planned exactly what I was gonna do. And so I saw it as a business opportunity and not as, oh, I'm gonna take a vacation or, or I'm gonna add a, a bathroom to my house. It was none of that. Uh, it was, how can I make this money as an inv angel investment will do? But in this case, I had to invest it with myself. And so if I fail, I fail with my own money. But if I win, I win with my own money. And so that money has not been touched. I grab money, and because of the amount of money that it's making again, it goes back, and so it's never been less than the amount of money they started, and it's just going up. And I don't kill myself if it's there, it's there. Uh, but uh, and they, if they call me, I'll, I'll do the art shows, and it's available. But uh, my focus is my, my other business. But it's fun to, to start with an amount of money and time and goals to see if you can meet those. And so it's a, a learning process for me. Louis, uh, I remember you uh, from Archer Hill. Yes. And um, I want you to speak to some of the activities that you have done as a fine artist in a fine art group. Mm -hmm. It's not just your business. That's correct. So if you could do that a little bit. Yeah, of course. So when I first moved here 20 years ago, um, I feel kind of, one of the things that, that all the cities that I live, I've always had friends who are artists and happen to be from La some part of Latin America. There's this cultural attraction. Uh, and, uh, and I couldn't find 20 years ago uh, 
those people here. It was harder. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to go to salsa night places where I, I'm not into salsa, mm -hmm. but you know, and I was like, okay, I heard that you're an artist. Yeah, okay, so let's go out for a beer. And then I heard, so huh. suddenly in less than like, two years, it was a group of uh, 10 people. Uh, and they, not only they became good friends, but all of them came from Latin America and were bicultural, bilingual, and all of us were working and doing fine arts on weekends, right? And so we started uh, 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 a group called Latino Artist Group, and uh, we, we were the, the media darling <laughs> 20 years ago, and we were getting a lot of money uh, from uh, fellowships and scholarships. And we're, we, what we did is put together uh, a studio, and uh, it, it was not well organized, but it was a studio that was quite big and and, and, and I don't know if you, I, I think you went to some of these shows, they're, they just got crazy. They were like, <laughs> you know, what I imagine what Andrew Warhol was doing with the factory. So it, it was really, really interesting. It was in Lake Street. It was on the most dangerous street in Minnesota uh, at that time. And we were in the basement and usually the party started at 11 or 12 o'clock. And so you will have all these drug dealers, pimps, prostitutes, uh, corporate America, uh, art critics, you name it, mixing it with music and everything, and it was, it was crazy, and it was a really, really good time. So, <laughs> I didn't know if I answered your, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good times. Yes, there's, no, no, obviously there's been, there's a, yeah, thanks for asking. Well, for so honor to be your mentee for two years, <laughs> and uh, I guess I have a question, uh, and also to say, which is like, um, answer your question, uh, he actually is a great, uh, artist and a businessman also his I was thinking about a giving example how 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 he take kind of mentee me from like a really artist way of thinking and to like design and design to both sides to which is the merge merge like arts and the designs together. This is I think for me before thinking this is no way. Uh, because what I think is, oh, okay, this is art, this is design, or something in between. It's, it's some like a, you know, like how is how does that work? So actually, um, it's a really great way to 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 you know learn from him, and also it's like bring the art uh, can be in the gallery and outside the gallery can be benefit more people and let more people to knowing uh, this art is not only existing the high gallery or something, everybody can be owns art, everybody can be enjoys art. I think that that's the really important about being an artist. So how we bring art uh, in the real world. And um, I think uh, my question for both of uh, um, artists and designer is like for, uh, for us, is especially the young artist or young designer, uh, what is the um, best, uh, best thing you think when we started uh, as we graduate, maybe you know, step out the school. Uh, what is the what's the thing is really important when thank you guys uh, step out of school? What it, what what was that period of time? Uh, how is that important to you guys and how how you guys deal with this time? And uh, uh, yeah, so maybe <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to start or do you want to just quick? Um, it actually didn't start for me when I graduated. It was even before. I, I, I really didn't get an F of what art critics or the press will say about my work or other friends who criticized me because I was selling. I think you have to have this confidence in yourself and what you're doing and, and, and just go forward, see what happens. Because if you start saying, oh, the, the student criticized me and you feel bad about it or there was a bad article on the press about my work or I didn't sell this month, so I'm bad. I mean, you just got to continue and, and believe in yourself. And, uh, and little by little, I think uh, that confidence uh, uh, that, that you project 
it will reflect on your work. But it's really got to start before, not once you graduated. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last two years, you've been able, you and pers personally, you're graduating now, you have developed that, but it took you some time, and it's normal. And I think with time, you're gonna create that language and feel very confident in what you do. And, and you can take critiques for what they are, but it should not uh, be the only thing that you base your work from, and you just gotta continue. Do you wanna say something to add to it, or? Sure. <coughs> Um, no, people, people a lot of times will ask like for advice and I have a, I'm always kind of hesitant, but I think when you just asked that question that something popped into my head. Uh, I th for me, really learning to adjust what my expectations were was super beneficial. Um, by that, what I mean is if you're making things from a place of not looking for something, not desiring fame, not desiring money, not desiring sales, not desiring recognition, but if you're just making something from an informed place and from a, a like lowering your expectations of external feedback, uh, a lot of people are looking for you know, the, the followers on Instagram or the, the likes from this or that or the, the gallery sales or whatever. Um, it seems like what I've learned after 43 years of living on the planet and being an artist for a, a few of those, um, that what's more important is what you want to do. What do you, what do you want to get from it? And if you want to get money, it's kind of like probably the wrong thing to do because you can make money or easier ways you know but if you want to get you know if you want to get fame it's like not the best way to do it <laughs> you make a cat video or something uh, but like if you if you really analyze what it is you want to get out of it so if you know if he's interested in community interaction then if you start to do those things by giving away artwork in the community and having a dialogue with your community uh, like that's a way to achieve that. For me, it was like all my life when I painted, it was all about like sound and music. And after 43 years of living, I finally realized like I have uh, probably some type of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, photographic memory, but it pertains to sound. Like everything is a sound for me. And so what's more important than painting is the sound. Like when I paint, I'm always making noises, boop, 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 or I'm thinking about the way something works. So it's natural for me now to be like, I'm, I'm clearly interested in sound and like music. So I always wanted to make graphics because I, was, I felt I was decent at painting or decent at doing that. And now I just realize like I can just let that go. I can shed that. Um, a good example for me is uh, when I was uh, painting realistically, a friend of mine said, the only reason you're painting the figure is because you want to prove to people that you know how to paint. And that like struck me. I was like, uh, yeah, because I was afraid to do abstract art because it just seemed like an abyss at that point in my life. Like I was like, well, how will anyone know I'm good? And I just let it go. So like I haven't painted realistic figures since then. I just stopped and said, yeah, you know what, you're right, I'm afraid to just be like who I am, to say what I'm trying to say without trying to be like, look, I can paint and this other thing. And so now I'm feeling like uh, I can almost just kind of like, in terms of visual art, I can just be like, you know what, I'm really interested in sound and music and collaboration with musicians. So I changed my expectations is kind of what I'm saying. Well, I think this is a good place to stop. So thank you for sharing your passions and your intellect and your life, creative life with us. Um, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>